Thank you for inviting us. Uh, my name is Paul. I'm a, a nutritionist and a certified diabetes educator. I've been doing this uh, now for coming up on 22 years. Uh, diabetes is definitely a condition that's chronic and progressive, meaning that today in 2013, we don't have a cure. And it's progressive in the sense that if we don't treat it aggressively, it only gets worse and everybody gets better by itself. Avoiding it, being in denial about diabetes never works out well. It leads to complications. On, in certain studies in the past, we've seen that people that don't control their blood sugar can uh, give up approximately 17 years of life, quality years of life, which is ridiculous. That's why we're seeing so many uh, people um, suffering from chronic diseases here in the United States. Is one of the issues is it's lifestyle. Well, the good news about diabetes is that the same lifestyle uh, habits that get us to the point where we're insulin resistant, we're pre-diabetic, or we're living with diabetes, can be reversed. Where you, with a lot of other chronic diseases, you can't actually say that. So that's the good news. Here's what's going on, and this is uh, from the, uh, some trials that have been going on. One in three individuals born in 2000 will develop diabetes, right? That's what we're looking at. 37 million uh, 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 cases are predicted by 2015. We have an increased prevalence of diabetes, partly due to the increased incidence of obesity. That's a major problem. We see childhood obesity rise. We see uh, type 2 diabetes and other chronic diseases uh, rise as well. Uh, impaired glucose tolerance is present in one in four individuals greater than 40. So already we see not only diabetes, but we're seeing prediabetes in the vast majority of Americans, right? Uh, cardiovascular disease and deaths are two to six times more common in people with diabetes compared to people not living with diabetes. And we know microvascular outcome, life expectancy, and quality of life improve with intensive glycemic control. In other words, keeping that blood sugar well controlled leads to great outcomes. Well, when we look at diabetes management, we always look at the five components. We talk about the importance of nutrition and meal planning, right? Uh, we know that the importance of staying active in controlling your blood sugar, not only that, your blood pressure, a simple little uh, thing we can do, just move our bodies more, walk more, take the stairs instead of, you know, taking the elevators, right? And then we know that stress, stress is a major contributing factor to poor health and, and overall outcomes, poor outcomes. So controlling and managing your stress levels are important. When it comes to blood sugar control, good glucose control, stress management is incredibly important because we know that physical, emotional, and psychological stress can spike up your blood sugar. Now the truth is this, that uh, uh, we know that medications by themselves don't give good outcomes in the long run if you don't make the lifestyle changes. With diabetes, we have the data to prove that. So if you're just taking medications and or using your insulin and not doing the other components like watching what you eat, you know, creating balance in your diet, managing your stress as much as possible, right? And being as active as possible, then you know it's uh, medications and insulin alone won't uh, just uh, give you great outcomes. And we know the importance of self-monitoring your blood uh, glucose, testing at home to see patterns, what's going on. So you start seeing patterns in, in how you, uh, certain foods are affecting your blood glucose. Everyone's a, a individual is unique and they process foods differently. How we combine foods also, if we have uh, other high fiber foods in that, uh, in that meal, if we combine it with heart healthy fats and, and, and uh, proteins, then you know that you might have a better balance in your nutrients and you don't see a spike up in your blood glucose. So testing is gonna verify, right? So we trust and verify. We trust that we're doing well, and then we verify by monitoring our blood glucose at home. I think one of the things that I've seen in the last you know, 20 years of working in this field is as people are testing more at home, are taking more control of their blood glucose at home, you're getting better outcomes, way less risk of complications. Diabetes mellitus uh, means to basically pass or siphon urinate mellitus meaning honey, glucose, or sugar, right? When your blood glucose is rising really high, the only way the body can get rid of it out of your system is passing it through the kidneys and out into your urine. If you actually have sugar in your urine or glucose in your urine, that's not a good sign, right? That shows that your body is actually now filtering uh, glucose because it's been high in your blood, right? Uh, what, what is it? It's a chronic condition. Chronic meaning uh, today we don't have a cure progressive condition. It only gets worse without treatment. It doesn't get better by itself. 
Uh, it's caused by elevated glucose. You, uh, different uh, types of uh, diabetes uh, underlying causes can be a little bit different. It is a lack of insulin, poor quality insulin, or cellular resistance to insulin. That's why they think that we're seeing so many new cases of, of diabetes because of the cellular resistance to insulin. Well, what's going on? Well, let's look at first real quickly the different types of diabetes. We have type 1, used to be known as juvenile or insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus. Type 2, these are the most common forms, right? Formerly adult diabetes, uh, used to be called adult onset diabetes or non-insulin dependent diabetes mellitus. Uh, now we can't call ad uh, adult diabetes adult diabetes when 9, 10, 11, 12 year olds are starting to get it, right? And then gestational diabetes is uh, a diabetes during pregnancy that is actually an incredible predictor of risk for a type 2 diabetes down the road for the mother, right? So that's what we're looking at. If we look at some of the more common risk factors for diabetes type 1, we know that it is an autoimmune condition, the, uh, the number one cause of this. This is where the body attacks the actual cells that produce the insulin in your pancreas and destroy them. So, and type 2 diabetes, there's a lot of factors. Uh, one of the things we're seeing so much more cases of diabetes is the obesity factor. Obesity increases insulin resistance. So now, you're in, even though you're producing enough insulin, it's not as effective. And then gestational diabetes is brought on by hormonal changes during pregnancy. The placenta releases a lot of different hormones, including cortisol, that increases the blood sugar during pregnancy. All right, what is, uh, here's how uh, we still look at uh, diagnosing uh, di uh, diabetes, right? They, they do a fasting blood glucose, right? Normal fasting blood glucose is between 65 and 99. Pre-diabetes is considered a fasting blood glucose between 100 and 125, and then diabetes, the, the cutoff point is one, uh, anything that's equal or greater than 126. Now, there's some uh, experts in diabetes that say there's no such thing as pre-diabetes or diabetes. You either are or you aren't, right? If your fasting blood sugars are consistently above 100, that's, that's not good. I mean, that's a sign that there's something going on there. You've got to take action. The key is this, making sure that you're getting your, uh, your lab test on a regular basis, this is getting your physical, and making sure you catch any, any of these uh, uh, fluctuations in your blood glucose at an early stage. The earlier we, we identify and we start treating it with intensive lifestyle changes, that's what I prefer to do, right, obviously, uh, we get way better outcomes in the, in the long run. So once we're living with diabetes, what is the goal? Your blood uh, sugar should be between 90 and 130. Means first thing, before the first meal of the day, right? Two hours after the beginning of a meal, less than 160. And then at bedtime, between 110 and 150. Here's a, a, a little bit of the diabetes process, right? Glucose is the body's preferred source of energy. The glucose has to go into the cells of your body. So what happens is glucose tries to get into the cells. The cell, every cell has what's called a receptor site. Think of it as a door, right? So what glucose does, it tries to go into the cell, but the actual receptor site is not open or there, it's not able to get in. Well, anyway, the pancreas produces a lot of hormones. One of them that's in particularly important for glucose metabolism is called insulin, right? Insulin, think of it as, a, as just as a key. All insulin does is go, uh, go and attach to the receptor site, open up the, the door of the cell, and it allows the glucose to go in there. Then it goes, it does this process. Eventually, you get uh, you know, energy, adenosine triphosphate, ATP, boom, and everything is as fine in the world, right? What is a major cause of insulin resistance? Well, one of them is the fact is that as we gain body fat weight, that causes insulin resistance. Okay, if our waist size is more than half of our height in inches, then we gotta do something about it. Anyway, okay, I'd like to share this because I think this is, this is, a, this is a studies that have been done in the past, like diabetes prevention program found that, that uh, in, in a group that was a placebo, right, that was given uh, a placebo medication to help control their blood glucose, uh, that were pre-diabetic, you saw that it, over the years you saw 11% uh, conversion into diabetes in that group. In a group that was given uh, metformin, which is a, med a common medication given to people with diabetes and prediabetes, right? We saw that 7.8% of them actually got, became diabetic annually, right? And then the uh, uh, people who were just given lifestyle information and followed through diet, exercise, stress management, and monitoring their blood glucose, 
you saw an actual uh, uh, conversion rate of 4.8%, meaning that placebo doing nothing more than doubles your risk of diabetes compared to doing something about it. But medications by themselves actually wasn't better than just doing making lifestyle changes. So as far as diet, here's what I tell people. Listen, it's all about balance. I want you to watch the amounts. I want you to eat uh, as whole grain as possible, least processed, all that good stuff. But you don't want to eliminate anything from your diet completely. It's about balance. Balancing your foods that are high in carbs, like your milk, fruits, and starches, with your uh, foods that are lower in carbs, like your low carb or your low starch veggies, right? Your heart healthy fats like nuts and seeds, avocados, olive oil, grape seed oil, these type of, uh, and yeah, you wanna get rid of as much bacon and butter from your diet. So, and also making lean choices in your meats that you eat, right? And then as far as dairy products, what we recommend for anybody over the age of two is either 1% or non-fat. I tell people, look at what you, how you're eating right now and just try to make small improvements, as little as just say, hey, cutting out a few, uh, you know, your portion sizes, moderating the portion size. So here's, a, here's the Mediterranean diet. If you actually look at the, a, f a food pyramid with the Mediterranean type diet, here's uh, what you see in the bottom. It's just more than just diet, but we know it's other things too, our lifestyle. Uh, what's the last time you, uh, families uh, you know, eat uh, regularly you know, together? We see that families that eat together have a way lower risk of childhood obesity in that family. And then here you go. Uh, your diet is going to be mostly plant-based whole foods, right? Fruits, vegetables, grains, olive oil, right? Beans and legumes, nuts and seeds. Oh, people are always afraid of nuts and seeds, so they're so high in fat. But they're in the heart-healthy fats, right? That's the important thing. And use uh, uh, different types of uh, spices and herbs instead of always using the salt shaker so much, right? Then seafood and fish as a main source of protein, right? Particularly uh, fish. A little bit of low fat uh, cheese and yogurt if possible and then poultry and eggs right and then meats and sweets on occasion that's what the Mediterranean diet says and four tablespoons of olive oil avocados are a staple in my diet the Mediterranean diet recommends four ounces of wine seven days a week seven glasses a week go ahead and look and look at the benefits of the Mediterranean type diet and chronic diseases because it's not about diabetes it's about the overall health of the person right look at clinical intervention studies in the past that showed decreased risk of heart disease of cardiovascular events and people who already have cardiovascular disease decreased risk in metabolic syndrome that's why we're seeing so much diabetes decreased uh, levels of CRP C reactive protein that shows the health of your blood vessels in your body and when you seeing, start seeing kids with elevated uh, CRP and all these problems, so look at all these different studies in the past that show that this Mediterranean type, I put Mediterranean type, not actual Mediterranean, why? Because we don't live in the Mediterranean, it's just making those small changes. And then you gotta look at your other numbers, it's not just about uh, just your blood sugar, you're looking at uh, your, your lipid panel, right? You're gonna look at your blood pressure, you're gonna make sure you do all your annual exams as needed and make sure that you uh, get your flu shot every year too. Good idea, right? One of my favorite books that I use, it's a, it's a plan, it gives you some really good background on the Mediterranean diet and it has a lot of good recipes. It's called Mediterranean Prescription. The Mediterranean Prescription. It's one of my favorites and I use it. Simple recipes, just gotta stock up with a lot of olive oil and garlic and then everything else. Olive oil and garlic, that's the beginning of a beautiful relationship. That's what I tell people. Thank you. Thank All right. you. Oh, thank you.